So on November 14th, 2004, the USS Nimitz is off the coast of Southern California doing training exercises, what we call workups, getting ready for the next deployment. Aboard the Nimitz as one of the Super Hornet squadrons in the air wing is VFA-41, the Black Aces. Now, that squadron is familiar to regular viewers of my channel because VF-41 was a Tomcat squadron aboard USS Nimitz in 1981 when they had the first Gulf of Sidra incident and two airplanes from VF-41, two Tomcats, shot down two Libyan SU-22s. So same squadron. So you fast forward, it's now 2004, VFA-41 is attached to the air wing. They launch a section, two airplanes, to do training. During this hop, the cruiser in the battle group, the USS Princeton, which has a very good radar system, has this contact. They want these two VFA-41 airplanes to investigate, and they say, we've been tracking this contact for some days. Can you check it out? So the two-plane of Super Hornets, in this case, is led by the squadron commanding officer, Commander Dave Fravor, former Top Gun instructor, and on his wing is Lieutenant J.G. Alex Dietrich, who's a first tour, what we call a Nugget pilot. Princeton gives them range bearing and altitude and they fly to that place. The skipper, Commander Fravor, tells Lieutenant J.G. Dietrich, hey, hang overhead and I'm gonna go down and investigate because at this point, the contact is down at low altitude. So he describes this contact as a tic-tac looking thing. So tic-tac, you remember tic-tac, the, the candy that comes in these little dispensers. And he also describes the motion as like a ping pong ball, very erratic, unlike anything you would see from a normal airplane. All right, so let's go to our training aids. So as the skipper is coming downhill, he sees the tic-tac looking bogey at very low altitude, moving, as we said, like a ping pong ball, very erratically. And then suddenly it flies up towards him and they merge. So he's like, is this gonna be a dogfight scenario? What, what's going on? I mean, it's definitely got his attention. But to his surprise, the tic-tac, the bogey, just stops and mirrors his movement. They do that for a short while and then suddenly the tic-tac just disappears. And it's picked up a few minutes later by the USS Princeton again, 60 miles away, which if you do the math, the time distance, means it went several times the speed of sound. There's no known aircraft, domestic or foreign, that can perform like that. The two VFA-41 airplanes land. They debrief the intelligence officer in the Carrier Information Center. And in turn, they also wind up talking to the strike group commander, the, the admiral. And he says, okay, I got it. And they hear anecdotally that he, he brought it up to the Pentagon and they're going to take it under advisement. So basically, nothing happens. They are told, do not talk about this. This is classified. Their FLIR footage is taken and made into top secret material. All right, so now fast forward to 2010. A guy named Luis Alejandro is starting this program, which is called ATIP, which stands for the Advanced Aerospace Threat ID Program. So his job is to take all of these sightings, all of the FLIR footage, different things, and try to run them to ground to figure out what is this. Basically, it's one of three things. It's either a domestic developmental program, 
or it's a near peer, so that means basically Russia or China spy program, or it's aliens. Luis Alejandros is doing his work, and he starts to get pretty good at it. What we know about particularly the Department of Defense is they will set up different programs. In some ways, these programs are kind of just to get the heat off of the Department of Defense. You'll set up a, a military spouse program. You'll set up a veteran employment program. You'll set up a POW return to the United States program. But what you see in all of these programs is if they start doing their jobs too well, then their budget line gets zeroed out. And I think particularly of the military spouse program that existed and the POW return from the Vietnam War program that existed. So it seems that's kind of what happened to ATIP. Luis got too good at what he was doing. And so as a function of that, his budget was zeroed out in 2012. So he kept doing what he was doing with a few of the folks who were working in ATIP, but he finally got frustrated and resigned in 2017. Put a pin in that part of the story. Now, meanwhile, in 2015, another Super Hornet squadron based on the East Coast saw a UAP off the coast of Virginia. So Super Hornets operating out of NAS Oceana, where I operated for many years, flying the F-14. And they had a sighting. One of the pilots, named Lieutenant Ryan Graves, claims he saw UAPs every day for several years when he was doing flights in the warning area, what we call vacapes, off of the coast of Virginia. And as what happened to the other Super Hornet pilots from VFA-41, he debriefed intelligence officers based there at, at the Naval Air Station in Oceana, and they didn't seem to do much with the information. So here's some FLIR footage. What you see here, and I have used the Lantern Pod, which is a FLIR, forward-looking infrared. This is AT FLIR which is the Super Hornet's FLIR, Advanced Targeting Forward-Looking Infrared. And FLIRs basically use not heat, but heat emits light, so it uses a contrast in light to paint the image. You can see in this FLIR footage, the uh, WISO in the back seat is able to get a contrast lock, and if he loses it, he can reacquire it. He's going between what we call white hot and black hot to establish the lock. So sometimes based on atmospherics or whatever the heat signature is, it's easier to get a contrast lock using white hot instead of black hot or vice versa. You see range to the contact, you see depression angle, you see altitude of the airplane, you see airspeed, all kinds of other stuff all around the perimeter of the display. And then also you see they jump between the TV picture and the FLIR picture. So this is undoubtedly something real. And the aviators certainly were convinced that it was real. And so I have no reason to disbelieve them, you know, being a guy from a similar career path. Also, there are some images that were taken that show that this is not, whatever this craft is, it is unlike anything that we're familiar with. It doesn't have wings. There's no propulsion. There's no smoke trails or anything else. This is really something that is uh, kind of amazing and unexplainable. So remember, that's 2015, where Lieutenant Graves gets FLIR footage, debriefs intel, and... As far as he knows, nothing is done about it. Also, as he talks about it, there's sort of this stigma associated with being the UFO guy. 
you know, people, his squadron mates, people around the air station are not taking him seriously. And we've seen this, you know, in, in times past. If somebody's like, I saw a UFO, Saturday Night Live did a skit about it. And, and so you can understand that these aviators, credible people with impressive pedigrees, are hesitant to speak openly about their experiences. Until 2017, when former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Millen, leaks the FLIR footage to the New York Times. The New York Times does a front page story about the UAPs. So at this point, the Pentagon has no choice but to make a public statement about what this all means. So they acknowledge that the FLIR footage is real. They acknowledge that what the aviators debriefed is unexplained and they cannot dismiss it as maybe agencies dismissed reports, you know, Area 51 and different things that happened back in the 50s and the 60s. So the Pentagon actually acknowledges that UAPs are a thing. The other thing to note is, remember, they disestablished a tip in 2012. They zeroed out the budget. Although Luis and his colleagues kept on the case until 2017 when, when he quit. But now, based on these reveals, the Pentagon has cranked up another agency within DOD that's called UAP Task Force. What that means is that another one of these sort of storefronts that allows them to say, no, no, we're on the case, check it out, we got this. Even with that New York Times story, the Pentagon, which is an expert at slow rolling headlines, doesn't really take decisive PR action on what is it exactly. And they just sort of hope that this will go away. And in, in fact, it kind of does. Until 60 Minutes, a couple of weeks ago, did a feature that highlighted the stories of Commander Fravor, now Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich, remember she was a JG in 04 when, when this happened, and Lieutenant Ryan Graves. Skipper Fravor is out of the Navy. Lieutenant Commander Dietrich is teaching. She makes a point to say that, look, this is now unclassified, you know, because she's still on active duty, so the fact it's unclassified is where she's comfortable talking about it. And then Lieutenant Graves is also out of the Navy, so he feels comfortable talking about, as a civilian, what, what he saw and what he thinks it is. Now, again, the Pentagon has to come out and, and give a statement that says, okay, once again, we're acknowledging that this flare footage is real, that there's something about UAPs that we don't understand, but we're not dismissing this as some sort of conspiracy or sci-fi fantasy. Based on that, once again, it's one of three things. It's a domestic three, five-letter agency developmental program, or it's a near-peer China or Russia spy program, or it is aliens. So let's talk about two and three. So first off, if this was a near-peer spy program, the Pentagon would not be cagey about it. So look at the history of the Pentagon teeing up threats, starting with Sputnik. There's nothing better for defense acquisition, for defense budgets, than an existential threat. So it was the Soviet Union for most of my career. Then it was the terrorist threat post 9-11. Now it's this return 
to peer conflict, near peer conflict, that is driving what we call the program of record. And that's how recent years we've had upwards of a $725 billion annual defense budget. And there is concern that under the new administration, the budget is going to shrink in the face of other administration priorities. So if this was in fact China or Russia spying on the United States with technology that had heretofore not been known about, then I believe they would definitely be socializing that in a more deliberate manner. So in terms of aliens, I think in terms of the rational mind, I'm not dismissing the idea that there could be civilizations out there, but what we've seen from the Mars expeditions and other things is planets that we're exploring really don't support life necessarily. And there certainly is no evidence on Mars of a civilization that could travel to Earth. So let me also dismiss that as root cause of these UAPs that we're seeing in the headlines most recently. So that brings us back to a domestic, you know, DARPA, CIA, a systems command from any one of the services, NASA, Space Command, kind of a program. And the other evidence that makes this possible is both of the sightings were in military training areas. So the first one in 04 was in the West Coast operating area off of Miramar and San Diego and Lemoore. And then the second one in 2015 was in Vay Capes, which is where I've operated hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, off of Virginia. Evidence would suggest that if you're only seeing UAPs in those areas, that this could be a test program. The other thing that adds to that is what looks like chance encounters. These aviators could be participants unknowingly in a, a test point of a test program. So think of what happened in 04 when the skipper went beak to beak with the Tic Tac. They could have been conducting a test point of a developmental test program that is what would the reaction be of a conventional fixed wing strike aircraft when they encounter our craft. And same, same on the East Coast. They're probably getting checks in the block to get to the end state of what this test program is. Now you go, but what about this Undersecretary of Defense going public? There's no government agency like the Pentagon in terms of misdirections and sleight of hand. And my next episode is going to go in depth with a program called Constant Peg that I participated in. It was the secret program in front of a secret program. So stay tuned for that episode. It's coming up very soon. The other thing I will say in history in terms of the government and DOD's ability to hide the truth is remember, if you've watched the Chuck Yeager tribute episode, if you haven't, um, I, I recommend you do it. It's a it's a great tribute to a great American. But in that, I say the fact that Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947, the fall, late summer, fall of 1947. DOD did not acknowledge that that, that had happened until the following summer of 1948. DOD has the ability to sit on information, to do misdirections in a way that they can make sure the public knows what they want it to know at any given time. Perhaps Luis Alejandro and Assistant Secretary Millen 
are part of this misdirection. And they actually collaborated in the end game when Millen leaked that footage, the FLIR footage, to the New York Times. That of the three options is my guess. That what we're seeing here is in fact a next generation, because just think about the leaps in technology that we've seen in our lifetimes, starting with fly-by-wire, stealth, and now we're seeing technology like Luis says during the 60 Minutes episode that can go 600 to 700 Gs, 1,300 miles per hour. It can fly through air, water, and space. No signs of propulsion, no wings or other control services, and in spite of that can defy Earth's gravity. So this is going to be a game changer when it finally is revealed to the public for sure. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. As always, if you're a first time viewer, please ring the bell. Like this episode, very important. Comments are awesome. This community is very smart, very informed, and I very much enjoy the comments and share these episodes at other places. As always, I appreciate your support above and beyond as a patron. So please join the ranks of our patrons at patreon.com slash wardcarol. I appreciate that support. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.